sure you get like to call this meeting to order, 601. But it was good. good. We're going to go out of sequence here a little bit. We're waiting for Shelly to, she had a little emergency, so the public meeting will be put on hold just for yeah. oh, a short period of time. So, so we're going to do first, we're going to review the minutes from February 11th. Mr. Chairman. Anybody have any questions? All in favor? Moved. Uh, you want to talk about the board articles first? Want to do those first? Um, well, it's, capital? Funny, it's funny you should bring that up because I've been approached by two select board members that said they have not received the warrant articles, and I was texting Don to find out. We, I know we sent them. Right. And out of my office, I thought we sent them. She's saying that went to all of them. But we're double checking that. But it has been completed to be sent out. And now I'm trying to figure out if there was a coach. If it's, oh, it was sitting in someone's yeah. inbox or if what the story is. But she's What's tracking that, that down. Oh, no, I, I, had, I was walking in here with the assumption that you received them weeks ago. Okay, so, so what do we do? Let's do an update on the capital planning until we wait for Shelly. How about that? Can you? Shelly will be here in 15 minutes. So we'll, we'll I mean, kill a few policies and, um, I can, and I can go through the beginning part of the budget and deal with most questions. But the more complex and you have Bill. We have Bill. Cool. <laughs> you want to stay on course then with the public meeting? Go here. Okay. Yeah. You want to Okay. All right. So uh, let me try to take Shelly's place here. Um, and then if we have a real complicated question, we hopefully she'll be here by the time it's asked. Um, there was a general narrative of the changes in the budget that there's plenty of copies of there. Um, and, I have that off. Me. You have the next and then, yes, I do have copies for the, the, the uh, membership. It's the same thing as last time. We didn't do any changes to it. But you go ahead and take one if you need that. And then also there's an assessment sheet for all the four teams. You guys need one? All set? Um, yeah. It's this one. Yeah. yeah, I got it. There is a full digital copy that was sent to all the select board and finance committees that, that, that was out there. We didn't make 100 copies of this very the thing that you have in your hands there. But if anybody wants a copy or wants to review a copy while we're talking, you're certainly welcome to take um, this copy that went through it. But um, you're kind of saving a, a tree or two because those got out several weeks ago without change. So, all right. Um, Walking through the budget, um, we are looking at the um, general fund increase at 2.84% or $326,045 for a total general fund budget of $11,792,437. Okay. Um, uh, the, you know, I, I can read through this for people or you know, um, basically the major um, funding changes um, is that we increase the substitute line item um, based on actual expenditures from the last three years. Um, we also increase summer salaries based on the ex actual expenditures for the last three years. Um, we're looking to increase the hardware software line for about $16,800. This is to, as we know, we're a one-to-one -one school and the, the, the Chromebooks are not holding up as well. I'm told that Google is coming out with a better Chromebook that's going to last longer. Um, but right now, our, our lifespan on those is four to five years. And obviously, a Chromebook needs to last six years. So the, the, the rotating um, of those, as well as the smart boards in the classroom, are, that we slowly put in, as you can remember, um, to the, I'll give you the history because I've been here, but through the last 10 years, we slowly put smart boards in each room. Well, they're slowly um, dying out. So we're looking to uh, fix those as well. I'm um, looking to increase custodial by $5,000 for the summer. Um, and this is based on OT um, and actual expenditures from the prior three years. We do have a retirement, um, uh, the, the retirement uh, severance package at $41,000. Uh, no, I'm sorry, that is for the uh, Franklin County um, Regional Retirement Assessment for $41,000. Um, and the employee separation cost, which I was talking about there, for $45,000 to cover retirements um, for our retirees that are leaving us this year. Um, within this budget. Um, the decreases, uh, we are decreasing from 13 IAs to 10 IAs. 
and one, one IA to one. spend revolving um, from the general fund. Um, we also have an added district, district placement reduction of 55,000, um, again, based on a change in enrollment going out of district. Um, the largest increases in the south of uh, what you're seeing here is the salary teacher salaries, which is um, 135,000 or 2.99% or is based on the contract and column step movement. So it's not just coal alone. Um, the IA contract as well, um, you're looking at approximately $26,000 increase of 4.07. Again, that's based on column movements and coal work combined. Um, and then um, finally, the wage increase and adjustments are included for non union personnel, administration, central office, principal secretaries, custodians, et cetera. Um, so, in addition to the general fund, uh, Frontier will be using revolving and grant monies to fully fund the school's total operating budget, which is $12,515,440. Uh, the second page that you have there, uh, you can look at the assessments. Um, and based on basically that long complicated formula that the state comes up with to determine how much each town um, owes. You know, you're looking at Conway at a, a 2.17, Deerfield at a 3.88, Sunderland at a negative 2.06, and Wheatley at a 5.54. It's a little bit different, but most people know what they're looking at there when I say it, and when Shelly says it. Questions, comments, concerns? Could, could you do me a favor and explain the transportation, both elementary and, and secondary figures that have changed? The figures, yeah. not just the, the bus and how the bus works. Yeah. 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 No. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Transport. So Frontier is a regional school district. This regional school district qualifies for regional transportation reimbursement. As part of the Student Opportunity Act, they were looking at look, at funding more to the regional transportation. When regional transportation first started, before my time in the administrative world, um, they were you know there was one of the incentives to regionalize. They were going to pay 100 percent of regional of mm -hmm. transportation. That got all the way down to I think like 52 percent at one point, where they were, where the state was covering. This year it is back up, um, and you're seeing that savings within the transportation line. That's due to the state's, the state's numbers. Okay, so that, that decrease in the, in the transportation cost is due to the increase by the state in it. So that's correct. Okay. That's correct. Thank you. Thank you for making clarity of what I said. No, I just, <clears throat> so it was going in one year and not out the other right. without stopping. And so the elementary schools do not, are not regionalized, so therefore they do not receive right. a break on transportation. We won't go down the regional, no talk about regionalization. <laughs> Very quickly, uh, student cost average per frontier, what would that be? I don't have that, so I can okay. show you when she shows up. I was just curious on what that would be. That would be a good number to get. Okay. If, yep. when, you, when you have time. Yep. That can be directed to the Deerfield Finance Committee. Thank you, I appreciate no that. Hi, Tom. I don't see him. Just getting back to the transportation for a second. Any discussions about trying to streamline it or create more efficient transportation, especially at when you look at some of these buses going by and there's three kids on it? I don't know if that's come up. I don't know if you kicked that around. Or so uh, basically, um, we just entered into a five-year contract with Grimco Transportation starting last year, uh, actually starting this year, negotiated last year. Um, you know, basically we put out what the <coughs> routes are, and we put out for bidding. And so, based on the size of the buses and the efficiency of buses, are again go into a, the bidding of those buses. So, well, I'm sure. Um, you know, group of transportation that they are buying, there's, there's a fewer, you have a newer, smaller bus now, I think you've seen it bouncing around town with a group of sign on it. Um, they're making some adjustments there, but they find it more, uh, you know, their financial package based on what their fleet is. And 
and so the fleet is the larger school buses. And based on the routes that we're seeing, and you know, for some, you know, again looking at elementary, elementary from Waitley, where he's got two buses for the size of its routes, or else you're going to have kids on the buses for longer periods of times. So. Right. <clears throat> no, so I mean, I was just giving us some thought. Is there any thing stopping um, the district or the union from? having pickup points and drop-off points. I mean, I know door-to-door -door service is wonderful, and we all love the concierge aspect of that, um, but any thoughts about, you know, we'll pick your kids up here, and this is where we're gonna drop your kids off. You gotta get them, I don't know, that's. Yep. I mean, there wasn't talk about that within the negotiation of that, or the, uh, the rebidding of that contract. Um, I think you're, Customers won't love that, especially the smaller children where door-to-door -door service is more of a primary. No, they won't love that, but yeah. if they see a reduction in cost and a reduction on their taxes due to it, yeah. I think it kind of evens out in the long run. I don't think it's going to cut down on a lot of miles. It's still going to have to travel to an A, B, C, or D to pick them up. You know, the way the towns are spread out, yeah. you're yeah. still going to have to, you know, you can't, you can't expect the mom and dad to travel halfway to the elementary school to drop their kid off at point A to get picked up. Well, I don't think we're looking for a solution tonight, Bob. I think my question was directed towards, has there been discussion? I'm not sure That's that your suggestion is legal. I well, don't there are, there it are, is. It is. you can go a while. <clears throat> it used to be you could make the kids walk a mile. Or a camel? Had to be uphill <laughs> both ways. Right. There is, is, a, there, is a, there is an amount of time, there is an amount of distance. If, if it's a mile, I'll run off that as back. But it's, it's, it's a, there is an amount that you can have students walk to a bus stop. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, I'll tell you, with the, complaint, the complaints I catch you know, as superintendent in, in terms of uh, transportation is when you get snow banks, then also you have safety issues because cars can't see around snow banks, our roads narrow, and if they have to walk down the side of a road, the people have asked me to move bus stops for those kind of reasons. Um, some of our high-speed traffic, you know, on some of those smaller roads as well, people are worried about kids walking down the side of the road when it's not sidewalks. So, just saying, the other side of what I hear when yeah. people are asking me to, sure. if they could change their bus stop or move a bus stop, that's what I'm hearing as parent concerns, which is, you know, yeah. obviously safety is our first priority. Sure. But I, I hear what you're saying, you know, we could, it's something that we can probably look at the next time through on that within that contract. I mean, the, I have to tell you, the contract that came in from Gripco, I and mean, this is going back to, this is history now from last year, but it was far more competitive than what other schools around us are paying for their transportation per um, for bus, bus route per mile. So yeah, we got a, I'd say a hometown discount um, from our yeah. hometown vendor. Um, so, well, I know people are frustrated seeing smaller bus loads, especially during athletic seasons at Frontier. I mean, some of those dismissal buses, you know, it's, you know, it's just far less. But they also did adjustment to one of the roads. Correct. That's correct. We did, right, so what Bob was just saying there, we did adjust one of the Deerfield routes this year um, in the afternoon. And so there was some savings there. It was kind of mutual on both sides um, to do that. So we did alter slightly um, the amount of ridership. But. So uh, based on clear.gov, you know, it's a website that uh, collates a lot of school data and stuff um, and town data. Um, it's about $18,760 to educate a child in, in this district. Um, about 655 students. So that's about 2% lower than similar districts. But still a lot of money. You have an idea. Am I right there? Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. a, couple, a couple quick questions. Any new hires for FY21? Yes. Um, just because Shelly did show up. For those of you who have not met Shelly Prater, the business director, she's here, am I right? Um, Shelly did a quick run through the speed and um, yes, the increases, do you want to go through, can I use hands to you, to go through the increases and because um, some were shifting up onto the revolving as well. So yeah, I mean, so. you touched on percentage. I, I, I walked through the whole sheet. Okay. So he's talking about the increases in the positions. Okay. Um, so so we have, we're talking about Frontier. Frontier. Okay. 
Sorry. My apologies for being tardy. By the way, I had a little bit of a family emergency this afternoon. So um, we are adding two and a half positions to the Frontier budget. Uh, 0.5 FTE is an existing employee. She's just being funded half now from the local fund and half from another revolving source. And there are two brand new hires built in, both full-time positions to the local budget. On those two hires, what positions would those be? Um, an English teacher and a board certified behavior analyst for the special education yeah, department. Yeah. Okay. Can I do a follow-up question? As far as uh, average class size, what's the range? So I could defer to George, but I'll, I'll start, and then you can kind of jump in. But the middle school ranges from uh, 18 to 24, depending on the class. And I understand that we do an inclusion, inclusion model of special education, so some classes may have, that's why you see a range from right. there, where you may have math classes that are smaller, um, because that'd be more on uh, um, skill sets versus um, the uh, social studies class that'll have more students. In. At the high school, it's far more difficult to calculate, because you'll have, you can have, um, some classes that could range up to 30 is our maximum. Mm -hmm. they, they're bouncing right at 28 to 30, depending on the course yep. and, the, and the numbers going through and going all the way down to George, I don't know, the, the class sizes of some of the smaller ones, but around 15, 15 and yeah, maybe even 12 in a specialized. Yeah, certain classes, not the majority of classes. But okay. Classes. Yeah. Reasonable numbers then. The, the reason why I was asking about uh, the cost average per student is historically, technical schools have run quite a bit higher than your academic schools and if I saw Franklin Tech's budget correctly their student cost per average was 18.5 and we're sitting here in a frontier you know environment and our student cost average is run 18.7 roughly you know that usually does not happen uh, for me, as a finance committee member, uh, that does raise a little bit of a red flag. So, but, and I understand about education, the importance of it and that, but it, you know, it does, it does create a little bit of a red flag for me. So, but thank you very much for the information. I appreciate it. I think that just to comment about per student ratio, uh, per student costs, I, mean, I, I can have, you know, Shelly dive into a little bit deeper because what you get off the DESE website for student costs versus other funding sources right. and that kind of thing and what numbers they're using versus, you know, are those costs, are you averaging in, you know, um, special ed placements of $45,000 into those, oh, that kind of I, stuff. So. Yeah. I just want to make sure that we're running right. off the right numbers right. and comparative. Right, and I, and I do too, to and be honest with you. That's why I asked the question. Yeah. I just want to make sure that we're comparing apples to apples, sure. that's and all. So those numbers I gave you before were 2008 averages. So, I mean, 2018, um, that's the latest data they have. Um, Franklin Tech at that same rate, at the same scenario was 25,000, just about 26,000. On that website. So on that, on clear.gov. Uh, yeah. Clear at Dove, so there is so a $7,000 right. difference so there is there. there. Yeah, there okay. is a difference there. Right. Whether that's, you know, again, the same, probably right. DESE's the best thing to look at. But. Right. Well, DESE's not, the DESE data, I mean, they're just dropping data in, mm -hmm. and so I was told that's not a good thing to look at. I see. So, um, hmm. as a total, but we can, yeah. if people just, want it, we can try to come up with what we think is the, what yeah. they were. Yeah. What they're saying is the right number of right. the decimal and, and I will also follow up with Franklin Tech. Yeah. To make sure where, if I where can get numbers right, are. if I can get where their numbers came from. So yeah. Thank you. Yep. So I had a couple of questions concerning the total total budgets. Uh, and when I look at this sheet. versus this sheet, my, my questions are gonna be off this sheet. And it looks here as if the total of all proposed expenditures was 12, if for next year is $12,515,400, is that correct? Okay. So if I were to take 
the number of students, would you say it was about 650? No, that's that's not uh, 650. Then you're looking at something in the 18, 19 thousand range. Yep. On this sheet, it tells, it, it suggests or says that we're going to use or you're going to use 290 thousand in school choice funds to meet part of that cost. How many school choice students do you have? That's correct. We have 168. So 168, the minimum that we get from school choice is $5,000. So let me ask you a simple question. 680, that's at least $400,000. We're only using 290,000. It's more than, that. what is, you've got 168 students that's eight hundred thousand dollars in school choice funds. Why are we only showing three hundred thousand, give or take? So we have school choice students going out as well. So Desi gives us the net of our school choice coming in and our charter coming in and our charter going out and our school choice going out. So the net amount that we'll be looking at receiving for FY21 is three hundred and nine thousand, and we're going to expend two hundred and ninety thousand. So we're gonna have we're gonna be able to put some for um, unexpected repairs or unforeseen circumstances. So then, then I would have to assume that the twelve million five hundred thousand doesn't include some out of district placement costs. That does include out of district. Includes our placement. estimation for out of district placement costs. Yes. So what I'm still seeing is. I don't see where that other five hundred thousand dollars. So any 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 resident that school choices to another district, we're swapping five thousand dollars. So that's those, an those are the wash. And if they're going to a charter school, we're spending out twenty thousand dollars to the five thousand dollars coming in. So any kid, who, any child who chooses to use a charter school, it's, it's around using their general numbers. Mm -hmm. It's around twenty thousand dollars that Frontier is paying out of its budget for that student to be educated at that's the charter true. school. So. After all the comings and goings, we're left with that number, not the 800,000, the number that Shelly just said. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? So, you with well, me there? Sort of, but if I look in this, I'm not going to see that in your budget, that no, out of district this, placement the, costs. The state takes it automatically. So when they build the estimate, the cherry sheet on school choice and charter, they tell us we're going to take in 1.4 million and we're going to send out 1.1 million and they give us the 300,000 difference so we don't have to allocate for those students that we're sending out out of district tuition for any special education students are included in here because that's above and beyond the choice and the charter numbers so i look if i look at the state cherry sheet for for frontier all i'm going to see is give or take Three hundred thousand dollars. Yeah, school it'll choice. break. It'll tell you exactly okay. each of the incoming copy. and the outgoing. No, it's all right. I've got a copy too someplace. But. So you have to do the math yourself because yeah. they don't do the math for you. But yes, it'll show you what's in for choice, in for charter, out for choice, and out for charter. And up until last year, correct me if I'm wrong, we didn't have any extra money. We were dealt about a wash two years ago. We were about a wash. We were, we were headed, we were headed we, for a long while, then yeah. it finally caught up. And one, and it was like it was 1.4 million. We were paying out 1.3 million or 4 million. It was almost a, a complete wash. But the charter schools are the ones that are that, that purchase. It's not the kids that want to go to Pioneer Valley down in South Hadley or something. It's the ones that want to go to the charter school. That's you know, 20,000 is four kids school choice coming in. That we have to pay for that one kid going yeah, to charter school at twenty thousand. We've got one of a student is going to Smith Oak, and the course of studies, as I understand it, is criminal justice, if you can believe it. Thirty. Uh, Thirty. Hmm? When you include transportation, it's slightly probably going to be closer to forty. Uh, yeah. Absolutely absurd. And that, and I'm not sure that anybody here would disagree with that. 
Yeah, transportation, transportation alone's got to be about 10 or 12 for the year for that. a kid to go from one of our towns. Yeah. Unless we have a nice parent that wants to drive them all the time. They still want the 20. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Well, if we had the terminal spot for everyone to, to come into, <laughs> they, they could disperse from, from there. <laughs> the Ryden Park. There you go. Um, I just had it. Are you done? Uh, are you well, for the, for the moment, that's okay. for sure. Yes. Just, uh, <laughs> it's the way you said that. <laughs> that's true. You got to be careful. <laughs> the, um, when I look at the budget, okay, um, now, SPED is all over the place. So, do you have a number for what SPED is here in this school? I don't. We talked a little bit about this already, we did. right? Okay. That was a week ago. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, it, we certainly can calculate the SPED numbers. I don't have that percentage with me, and it's a little bit complicated to calculate because it's not all in one spot. Um, so it might be allocated under instructional assistance and then some under teachers and other staffing, physical therapists, occupational therapists, all of those pieces. And the way that the state puts out the function codes, it's not all in one line item. Uh, the other thing that is a little bit tricky, especially with our IAs, is that they may be in a regular ed classroom, but they might work part-time with a special education student or full-time with a special education student. So we're happy to definitely pull that information together. It's, it's just not exactly black and white. So you're not keeping track of it while you just started? So. Yeah, and I just started, so I'm definitely not keeping track of it right now yet. If they if they have in the past, I don't know if you have historical I mean, information hasn't... on it. It has been split out in the past. Because I was, then I would say, what do you what, what do you do with that information? You find out your your total expenditures for special education, but that's the needs of the students you have. You know, so well. I think what you do with that information is public awareness of those kind of spends, mm -hmm. and that can generate activity at one level or another. But that's how things get changed in the school setting is when taxpayers start knocking on doors and start cre creating a milieu with, you know, right. everybody I mean, right else. Now, um, Joe Comerford has put a bill through to study, it's just right now just a study with the special education costs and how they're reported because they feel that the state is not accurately funding special education costs um, and you know, basically saying that the, you know, 16% is, special education population and our population is much higher than 16 percent so um, you know she's mm -hmm. trying she's trying to gather information on that so that we can provide the numbers of our actual expenditure it just seems to me it's kind of gone away there was one time when it was just the talk of the town you know sped costs and how many kids and how they were getting in and who's paying what comparatively to the mainstream kid um, but that's kind of gone away and it's kind of just weaved its way into all of the little line item budgets all over the place. And I, I would advocate bringing it all in to one spot. Charter and school cost kind of took its place for a while because there was a huge uproar for, for a couple of years about doing something to, to equalize that formula. Like Jeff was 18, 18 out and five in. Right. But you don't have to be a math wizard to figure out that you're, you get 10 kids chartering out and you got a problem. And we've got yeah. more than that. And you can't, even if you don't participate in the school choice program, you can't stop them from chartering out or choosing out. You can only stop them from coming in. So that's not the answer either. So uh, yeah. until and, yeah. they figure out how to fund that <laughs> equitably. Yeah. And, and you as finance committees and we as selectmen and, and school committee have, have no insight into their budget. No real insight. Mm -hmm. um, and, and no you accountability. Know, and you probably don't know that they are permitted to, uh, to have marketing budgets. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the it's definitely frustrating. There's no question about it. I think it's frustrating for all of us. We're all more or less in the same boat. They have zero accountability for the most mm -hmm. part. Yep. They, they I, always, what they want. I always wondered whether it wouldn't be worth getting together with Smith Academy, and I'm staying this kind of tongue in cheek, and maybe marketing to the Boston area. Uh, an agricultural program out here for Boston area students and let the Boston schools pay for that tuition and transportation and housing costs 
and see how long that would last. I think there's a few of those schools between here and Boston. <laughs> I, we can put a special yeah. spin on it. Put a special so. spin on it. Yeah. You should see the tech schools in Eastern Mass. Talk about funding the schools. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Their palaces and the programs they provide. Are, uh, What's the one down the case that has over 20, 21 or 2200 kids at a, at a, a tech school? Oh, Upper Cape Town? <laughs> Which is it? <laughs> <laughs> Must be the kids. It was great. <laughs> the, the, the last thing, and then I'll be quiet. Uh, is that a problem? <coughs> Never seen it yet. <laughs> Do it. Uh, a decade ago, when I was teaching in Greenfield, sitting down with the uh, with the teachers union uh, or, or the representatives of the teachers union going through the budget that was being proposed and this was back when when the uh, the line item numbers were pretty easy to go through and you could separate out those that were uh, typical ed regular ed special ed and then the ones like you know fuel fuel and and uh, those kinds of things clearly are not, you can't assign to a particular education. And I was surprised to, that by the time I finished with the totals, and I've forgotten what the totals, this was for the, the entire town, uh, and there were some things that really weren't in there. Uh, but a budget that was, I think it was around 17 million, that approximately a third, plus or minus, could be attributed to regular ed, Darn close to a third to special needs young classes, and a third to overhead. Uh, and I think Bill can attest to going back to the 70s when the Department of Ed and the, general, and the legislature told us that special ed was probably going to end up costing us four or five or six percent of our budget, and that they would take care of covering it, so it would not be a an expense for us. Uh, well, I don't think they're paying 30% or 40% of our budget these days, so. Yes. They're, they're at 20%. The state in general is 20% of our budget. And we don't get that. Kind of, out here we don't get that, at least on Ellen Deerfield. In 1976, they were 41%. So um, not that it can be solved in this <clears throat> this budget year, but I, I still, you know, I know that there's been look at there's been people looking at HR sharing for between the towns and the schools. I think that's a smart way to keep looking at that because it's very expensive for the towns and it's it's so intertwined our our clerks and treasurers what they're dealing with on a day to day basis. And mainly, I'm speaking more not on the frontier level, but um, the different elementary school budgets um, that you know all those employees are the town employees but a lot of decisions get made through the school and affect the town so i just think more closely collaborating with the schools on that and also um on maintenance and we've frontier has gone uh, a huge step in developing our our capital um capital program and we have a great group of select and school committee all working on you know what what this building needs and the grounds need um but there's also those soft kind of things that are, you know, fixing a door jam and, you know, the, the kind of the, we're looking at this in town too, you know, instead of sending our highway guy, we really need a, you know, we really need a um, kind of a jack of all trades carpenter, you know, not full on plumbing, but could change a light socket if he had to or that kind of things. I mean, maybe it gets into more of that, you need licensing for some of that stuff, but but just the general repair of uh, some of the things before they get so far that we end up having to spend a lot of money to fix them. Um, I would just love to see us work together as a school and as towns. Um, and I'm sure Waitley could use it, Tom, everybody can use a guy, you know, that maybe had a truck and could go around and start addressing some of the smaller maintenance stuff that are more, take more skill than a highway guy has or, you know, some of our DPW guys have. Um, but not a full-on 
you know, construction out to bid kind of project. So I'd just love to see more collaboration that way too. But I know it's tough because you, you know everybody's looking the, for the money. Pro, yeah, those, the, the, that, all, that sounds great in theory, um, but that's one of those the devils in the details kind of a thing too. Because the the, the human resources per, the 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 proposal um, report from the, whatever that I saw called for the. Um, the vast majority of that salary to be borne by the uh, by the school, mm -hmm. and um, call for it to be a full time position valued at a hundred thousand um, dollars. And one of the real important things to how well your school doing is the ratio of administrative expenses towards mm -hmm. the rest of the budget. And you add you add a big chunk to it to. to a tight, it's a small well, administrative unit. Well, you add a big chunk to that, then the, you know, that's, that's a red, think, you know. But I think everybody can recognize that, that, you know, like we did with the capital project, if you're upfront about it and you tell the towns, this is what it is, this is what we're doing, and we're saving you money and headache, constant headache in your town offices as you're dealing with the multiple insurance stuff and, you know, teacher come, teacher leave, you know, all the different things that go along with it. And, and you know, we have no HR experts in town. It's not like, you know, we're, we're on the fly. So I think if people recognize like we're doing with the capital, we're upfront about what we need, what it's gonna cost. And, and I'm not sure about the report, but we can work out the details. I mean, devil's always in the details, but that's how you address it. You put it on the table, you can't ignore it just because it's a difficult subject. I mean, you have to dig into it and find out a way to fix it. So you're, you're having issues in Deerfield keeping your building facilities up to snuff. Oh yeah. I mean, not just not just Deerfield. I mean, every every building. It's uh, you either going to sub a guy out to do a big project, or your you know, and your janitors are more than the maintenance. Day yeah, to day, day to day. You know, we've got Door a facilities locks, man yeah. manager in Waitley, mm -hmm. and our highway guys a really good Keith I got you back right now yeah um, and they do a lot of stuff yeah they do and our guys do too but how you know you get there's so much to do with our aging infrastructure I mean it's yeah all the buildings are over 50 years old and it's it's, maybe tough. it's time to take one of the buildings when there's maybe extra money in the town do a warrant article or two for whatever new roof on the police oh, station we do or whatever it, like we that. do that all the time I'm talking the day-to-day -day stuff but personally, whoever takes kids, like in the school, we have great custodians probably in every single school. We you know we do them lately. Yeah. They take care of the everyday needs that we have there. If it's something bigger, like an HVAC problem or something like that that we can't take care of, then you got to call in the experts. You just can't have somebody on retainer I'm just do little projects from town to town. I mean, it's some of those, not some of those little projects the custodians still do. Yeah, but our custodians should be maintaining what they're doing not not doing construction work or replacing a door jam or doing that kind of thing that's you know there, there's a le there's a difference in between those two of you know they really there's a lot of work for these custodians to do and they don't have the skill to be doing some of that other stuff that doesn't need to go out to bid you know somewhere in between i just think it's worth worth looking at in the long term how to share that cost i think with trevor's if I, oh, can, please. if I can, please. I think Trevor's trying to explain the difference between a custodial staff in doing the basic maintenance throughout the building with an actual hands-on facility manager. And there is quite a bit of difference as far as what level um, and skill levels that's involved. And I, I you do see it. Uh, I think all of us are, as far as towns, have realized that our schools, school buildings are an asset to the town. We're, you know, Frontier here just had a capital budget approved in the elementary school. We're trying to, through the capital improvement committee, we're trying to make sure that we address the needs of the elementary school. And it's important if we if you're going to put the money into the buildings, then you definitely want to put the money into maintaining those things that you're putting in also. So it, I hear what Trevor's saying. I don't know if that helps clarify a little bit, but there is a difference between 
custodial uh, job description compared to an actual hands-on facility manager. And I've seen it in schools where I've seen people go through and you know you talk about tread replacements here in in this building in other buildings that i've seen those tread replacements were done boom as soon as one started coming loose it was replaced there is no question about it it was just done and you know little things like that instead of letting them build where all of a sudden now you're looking at a capital plan and well we got to do all the treads and that shouldn't shouldn't get to that point point. and as trevor's saying even with you know door hardware and that, you know, crash bars, those should be replaced immediately. You know, those shouldn't be, well, we got to put it on a list, put it on a list, put it on a list and put it down the road. And what you really need is somebody on hand that can do that. So you really need a, a good solid job description of a hands-on person that, you know, there's quite a bit of a skill. Kind of like a plant maintenance person is mm -hmm. what you need. And more of a, you know, maybe we can share that between the two. I mean, look, our our budget in town is 70% education in school. I mean, it's a it's a huge chunk of money, and uh, it leaves us very little to do, you know, the rest of our running of the town. But um, we know it's important. It's what makes our our uh, community what it is, and um, it's it's all the hard work the teachers do, the administrators, all of us here as volunteers, because it is such an important part. I just want to see it maintained and. Um, just something to think about in the future budgets. Bob. So, Bob, I might suggest that some people look into the COG as to whether or not they can put together a grant proposal mm. to set up some sort of a uh, program on Shared trying services. to do that yeah. to get some thought. state funding. But uh, good thought. I, I think that to do it just at the, at the regional school level, what it is, is selling the school with an awful lot of overhead to begin with but it, overall the cog could probably come up with some sort of a grant formula and how to work it and probably get some uh, soft money yeah there are it's a good thought because they're so, doing mean, a lot more of these shared services kind of thing and that's what i mean we have to work well, together to get it done so but I okay think, i think the cog could probably they, they seem to be able to get all kinds of grants for things like that <laughs> well we'll try it's a good thought bob thank you Please. But, there, but there's but there's a certain amount of sort of, I, you know, I'm, I'm listening, and on the one hand, it's red flag, you're spending too much, and on the other hand, it's you need to spend more and hire more people. I don't think you've so, seen a, a red flag of you're spending too much here. All right. Uh, have there been a discussion of that tonight? I don't think so. Though. Well, Skip talks about it all the time. Yeah, well, he, he tells sure. you to make sure you, you know, <laughs> we all want to That's Skip. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's to be honest right. with you, I'd be talking money too. But, I said I'd be quiet. That's right. <laughs> but we are, we are running into that. And I'm not advocating, but at some point in time, it's not how much you spend, it's how you spend yeah, it. Exactly. And you want to spend it wisely. And so, uh, as Trevor just pointed out, the schools are a big portion of our budget and it, it's becoming a major struggle for towns to make sure that they can do what they need in the town plus take care of the schools and at, at some point in time hopefully we can all realize that we have one budget not two separate budgets and a lot of times people kind of look at like two separate budgets schools got their budget they can do in the town fend for yourself type thing and that shouldn't be happening we have one budget you know and i realize it's regional so we're split but the school is part of the town budget and and we really need to we really need to try to watch that and maybe work together a, a little bit more closely mm -hmm. on that and you're right it's hard to say yeah one minute you're saying well you've got to cut back and the next minute you're saying well you got to add <laughs> well sometimes we got to think outside the box and get a little more creative and really take a look and it's you can't you can't make a decision on one general mm -hmm. little conversation like we're having tonight but if you really sit down spend some time with people and look at it Sometimes you can work those things out without adding a lot of cost. So that's, that's just, just my like thought. I'd like to speak out just the, 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 um, the way that this budget was put together and this, how this budget looks, like, um, like these are the good old days for this year. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, 
this yes is if, if you're really aware of what all of the different constraints and oh, yeah. everything else and the reality oh, yeah. that we have to operate within it's it can't get much better than this we know that. Um, yeah. we, we understand, we still we understand how you people put a lot of work into your yeah, budget, just like the town still does. Yeah. Yeah. We're, we're all a little strapped. I just want to say, Shelly is new to the, to the team, but no, she's fantastic. done a hell of a job. Yeah. I, uh, yeah. Trevor, I know you've worked fantastic. closely with Shelly, yeah. but she is, she's doing five budgets. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just remember that, five budgets. Mm -hmm. Now you guys work on one, mm -hmm. but she's got five that she has to do, so it's it's tough trying to, you know, just try to look up, just to look up how much per kid, you know, maybe if, she, well, she had her computer, but, you know, maybe she could look it up. And, <laughs> yeah. And ask Siri. Okay. Yeah. Say, can I just... A uh, couple more questions? Yep, yep. Uh, I need a little point of clarity here. We had a conversation concerning upkeep of the building and heard something about repairs getting onto a list and what's mm -hmm. up. Do you have any problems getting things repaired here? I mean, if something needs to be repaired, you just pick the phone up and say, do it, or what's the problem? Do I have a problem? I yeah, is there a problem in the building with having there's not repairs? A there's not a problem with it, no. So with things are done expediently and some well? Things are done, some things are done expediently, some things are not, are take, take longer. It depends, on the, it depends on the cost. It depends on what we're looking to fix. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it's not. It's not that. It's not that black and white. I mean, there are certain okay. things. Like, if we need to get lockers, yeah. like you know, yeah. we have. There's yeah. a process we have to go through in terms of ordering it. It's like you know, where does the money come from? So, it's never that simple. It's like there's a, a lot of sen sensitivity around the maintenance of this building. I wouldn't say sensitivity, but I would say that there's a lot of you. You basically, in terms of, you have to you have to be certain about like. Like if I'm talking about lockers, like where's the money coming from? I have to make yeah. sure that we're pulling yeah. the money from the right yeah. spot. Right. You know, if we're talking about walkie talkies, which mm -hmm. are expensive, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. We're talking about like, you know, thousands of dollars. So where are we getting the money from? So it's not as simple as like just you throwing out a credit card because yeah. it's public. Obviously, but if the door is broken in the hallway yeah. today, yeah. it's tomorrow done or close to it? Close to it, but maybe a week or so. Yeah. Okay. okay I think so here in the conversation, you know, and through the history, we've talked about the difference between maintenance and custodial. Mm -hmm. And to hire this, this, this handyman maintenance in a market that, if anybody knows the contractor market right it's now, a lot of money. you're an electrician, you're not coming to work at a school as a handyman. Yeah. If you're a plumber, you're certainly not coming to work at a school as a handyman yeah. in this current market. Right. If you're any good. Right. Um, you know what I mean? If you're HVAC, there's a little bit of both those things, you know what I mean? We could hire a full-time HVAC person right now and right. Save, and to save money but who, who in their right mind would right. can do hvac would do that yeah you know because the amount of bills that go around we talk about that bob lesko you know through the years has talked about that you know that kind of position to go through and just fix a doorknob fix those kind of things the other side of things is you find things that are broken and you say just replace it well there's no hardware to our front doors Right. So if you go through our front doors, one set of sealed set of doors, it used to be double set sealed doors. We don't have the hardware. So we don't have $200,000 to replace the entire door system because we bought doors when we built this building 20 years ago that were, our, they don't they were on discount because they were going out of business or something. I don't know if there's no more hardware to those doors. So, you know, it is, there is deferred maintenance yeah. out of necessity. You know, you say like, is the door fixed? Where does the door go to? <laughs> You know what I mean? And you know, how fast does it get fixed? Right. If it's an outer door, it's fixed tomorrow. Now. If it's yeah. an inner door, okay, well maybe we should combine it with something else to save money. Next time we got the door guy out, we'll do two doors or you know that kind of thing. So we do save projects and that kind of thing. So it's kind of a mix, but the idea that maintenance person has been floated before, but I will tell you, you know, the it's same problem I had with the HR person, because I was part of the HR study, is how do you allocate time? Right. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yep. If, I, if I get stuck in a job, and I'll pick on Waitley, yep. if I get stuck in a job in Waitley, For a week that and percentage wise of the, if we're out of the frontier contract is only 10% yep. of the frontier bill. Yep. Okay, but you're there for two weeks fixing a door jam that can't yep. get can't get square. Yep. Okay, whatever we're making. No, we're fixing I, I there. agree. It's a you hard know, the rest of us are saying, whoa, 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 whoa. Yeah, you know, fairness. We get, you know, yeah. who's tracking it? Now I gotta get a, a, an administrator just to track that one person right. to make sure it's Let's equity get, across all buildings. Then you have multiple buildings in multiple towns let alone just schools it's a hard nut to you know track. because we do this with technology yep. Yep. we have a technology crew that that works yes. in all five schools okay yep. but in the beginning it was exactly that we get him for a full day he needs right. to be in our building for that full day 
now when things are running smoothly, we don't have that problem. But I remember saying, oh, yeah, I remember when I was a principal, at the time I was assistant principal, where is he? You know, right. we're the biggest building, you better yeah. be here fixing our computers first. You know, it was We've been down there. So those are some of the, the, the and I think you I have think, to kind of work those out. I think the work that you've done, you know, spearheading the, the capital program has, I think, has come a long ways in kind of addressing those needs and getting the towns to work together. And it, it, I can't speak highly enough about that committee and what they do. And um, so I think we'll get down that road eventually. But I just wanted to drop. I didn't mean to have it to get. It is. I mean, you've got to look at the, that capital. You're absolutely to, I'll toot my own horn on that as well, in the sense that it is the clarity of what is coming down the pipe yeah. is, is 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 there. You know what I mean? It if is. something gets jumped on there, it's not. You know, there obviously that may happen down the stretch with some sure. breaks that we didn't see foresee, but yeah. people can predict. This is what we have coming. This is what's on the A list that has to get done because of the danger or programmatically the school can't function a certain way. Those right. get moved to the top of the list, and, and we're kind of. It's an open yeah, dock that we're sharing with is. people and, and it's, so been great. it's coming. This is the first year we're taking a good swipe at those things. Right. You know, so yeah. Um, and the majority of that is through E and D, which you know it we is. could do quiet I would say more quietly, we still have to go to the towns for approval, but more sure. quietly on the side. But instead it's fully transparent. Yeah. We could add, and this came up at one of the town um FinCon meetings, that we could add fifty thousand dollars more to the budget to deal with maintenance issues. But right now we have this process in place where we're saying we're handling this deferred maintenance with select board members and school committee members yep. working together to say, hey, this is what we're working on this year, this is what we have next year, and this is what we have the year afterwards. So I think it works I mean, really good. I think it's a, it's a different process, yes. but it's a lot more transparent. Yep. Yep, works good. I just was wondering about your OPEP costs. Um, I think it's line item 5250. Um, is, that, is that OPEP or? I didn't know what 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 you as a um, district is putting away every year. We have not put anything away in this budget. Oh, okay. This is just um, the fifty-two fifty is just health insurance contributions that we have to make for retirees. Okay, so it's not an OPEP payment. All right. Have you done any OPEP payments at all yet? Yeah, we've, you have. we've set up the OPEP thing, put a hundred grand in. That's what I thought. Right. Yeah, I think it's about somewhere around one hundred and ten thousand. Okay. But nothing's been put in since well, that initial deposit. And it was a couple of years ago that the auditor um, hmm. uh, did request us to put in more. Mm -hmm. And we put in a few thousand more than he requested, as I recall. But, um, uh, I know it's hard to put I know money it's away. Really hard, but we're, but it's we're trying to do it on the town, too. To You're like, oh. And keep the assessment low. Yeah, uh, yeah I, know. I know. I know. But, but it's but like what's going to hit us all if, eventually. If you're so. putting 150 for your retired insurance already. What we did is do a percentage of what our insurance was this year and then we plus. We did four percent. Like four percent in addition. Which so is nowhere near enough, but it was something to get started as a policy. So um, it's like 50, 56,000 maybe this year. Nothing. All right. It's not very much. 40. 40? Is it 40? 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40. So I was just wondering if you would, you know, consider that because the problem is, it it it's so overwhelming, and and I I don't agree with the calculations, but there is there is an obligation, and and it, and if you don't put anything towards it, it's it is overwhelming, and we're just kicking the can down the road. That's all. Um, I've asked this question in previous years, but now that we have a new business manager, I'll ask it again. Um, why is it that when we look at the budget, we can't see total administration costs and central office costs? It's it's so it's kind of like the sped thing again. It, it's so broken up and, and just popped There's into different items. categories. There's line items for all that, but in the not in that paper, but the, the bigger what in here. Yeah, there should be a sentence. And this one here. Yeah. Oh, I don't have that. That one here have all the lines. I actually think that the admin costs are easier to pull out in the budgets because of the way that the function codes are set up. Um, and if anyone doesn't have a DESI chart of accounts, I'm happy to share that with you because it gives you some clarity on what all of these numbers mean. Um, okay. But it's pretty clear of, of what school committee, what superintendent, what's business and finance. They really make us group all of those pieces together. Where it does get a little bit trickier is the benefits. 
and with the central office staff. Yeah. Um, but again, we try to label things and depending on the coding, um, we could pull it all out. And what I was thinking about when you had asked about the special education costs is the end of year report is supposed to do some of these calculations for us. That's the DESE required end of year report that analyzes all of our funding um, and how we've spent our money that's coming in. And it might be easier for me to look at some of those things than to look at this. Um, it's always a year behind, of course, because yeah. it's um, state reporting, but it might give us a better picture on some of those things. Because it is, it's allocated really clearly of what's admin, special education, regular education. They break out transportation in different ways. So hmm. that so might be something that would to look at. Yeah. It's not easy to read, but it might be something to look at. And that gets so audited read. every year by um, for Frontier, it's an annual. At the towns, it's a, a three-year cycle. Um, but that report is audited to make sure that we are spending the money the way that we're supposed to be and that we're reporting it properly. Too. Is that a, like a July or a um, August? It's due uh, in mid-October, October. October 31st, I think, or October 15th. Um, okay. But obviously, you can't finish it until the end of the year. But right. you know, we can always get started on some things. But it's yeah. due end of October. OK. Say so the uh, just my last point. Um, I think the, um, the sub substitution substitute teaching costs they're right about $75,000 according to this budget here they've been as high as almost a hundred um, and thinking back to what I read in the paper concerning the um, negotiations on the new teacher's salary teacher contracts um, and how that committee was trying to um, sort of do away with the banking of sick days, time off, which, and I applaud you for that. Um, I guess my question is, does the math hold out? Like, so you're mixing contracts. This is the frontier meeting. The frontier teachers moved that from the contract two contracts ago. Oh, okay. So the that's elementary not elementary still have that in their contract, and that's one of the things that was discussed yeah. publicly as one of the negotiating plus sides of the school had about removing that. But the frontier teacher, there's a grandfather point, but new hires are not are not allowed to be doing that. Okay. The so teachers that are now in the elementary school, we're not taking that away from them. Yep. It was just anybody after July 1st okay. that we were, we were trying to do. And okay. Or limit some of it. We still had it, but it was just. And Frontier's contract is the same way. There's a date in there when right. they yeah. made that change, and it grandfathered in anyone sure. who was an existing employee before that change took place. Okay. So are, are you doing anything for the new hires at Frontier that in, in that regard to offset that? or They still get sick days. Yeah. You can't sell them back. It's a limited amount yeah. that they get. You can only get up to, I think it's 160 days, the first 100 are a certain amount, or maybe it's 130. Um, and then the remainder are at a little bit higher rate, um, but it caps it, you know, significantly. But that's not, that's not different for employees that have been here for 20 years. The employees that have been here long term are eligible for the two day buyback per year based on the contract at their current rate. Daily rate of pay. But two contracts will so we change that for all new hires moving forward. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, right. It's going to take Thank a while you. before yep. we start right. seeing any yeah. savings in, in sick buybacks for retirement. So that's. So you don't feel you're pushing people to use all their time? No. 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 Okay. No. Sick days or should be for sick days. When you're sick, somebody comes down with cancer, need 100 days, we have 100 days. It shouldn't be part of it should be part of retirement after 30 years selling back two days for every day you're sick hey, you're sick private sector that's just my opinion private private sector did that years ago and i think the public entity like this has taken a long time to catch up and it's dollars and cents and none and my only concern is that you can say it all you want that sick days for being sick but you know as well as I do that it's kind of a cop launch thing um, for and I uh, and so you've you got to make sure you're not driving people to use all their days and if that happens you have the administrative club to be able to rectify it um, that there, there is language in the contract to, that 
makes that difficult. I'm not yeah. saying that every sick day is done with sickness, but the, the abuse of that, there is language in the contract that allows the administration to, to address that. Mm -hmm. um, so. Okay, I'm done. Jeff, it's, it's, it's there. It's but, in there. It's but, but in general, I, you know, I'd just like to speak in favor of just, you know, we, we have an administration now that is, that is capable and willing to do these deep dives into the structure of the way that they do things to address things like that, which are hard to deal with. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for years, the, 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 this issue, um, uh, I, don't, I don't know how hidden this issue was. But, um, but, but it was easier to just keep kicking the can down the road in many respects, I suppose, than to, than, than, than to address things like this. Because uh, they're sticky and they're not, uh, they're not amenable to yeah, you know, yeah, kind of, yeah, uh, whatever, it's, 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 it's sticky stuff. So, um, so you know, we, we got it good right now. That's my point. Mm -hmm. none, of, none, of the, none of the principals, none of the administration, correct me if I'm wrong, have buyback anymore in your contracts, new contracts. Not a single, not a single day. <laughs> Sorry, <Jordan. laughs> But people still come work in our district, isn't that guy? Like, <laughs> they do. Yeah. Sure, it's it's like, I don't. <laughs> yeah. Right. Any other questions about the budget? Thank you. Uh, Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Next thing is, can we uh, finance report for this year, Shelly? So I do have the warrants here. Um, Bob did come in and take a look at them. It'd be great if we could get at least one other signature on this. I know he's been looking them older, but it would be lovely to have at least another set of eyes. You know, it's a lot to look at, um, but for auditing purposes, it's good to have another signature on there for us. Um, so there are 18 warrants presented, totaling $1,619,610.68. You have that? Can you hear that? Okay. So much. <laughs> um, I did send out the general fund and school choice reports ahead of time through February 29th. Um, nothing new to report, no new concerns. Um, I have not moved that money yet. You'll keep hearing this from me month to month. I want to wait until we get closer to the end of the year to make sure that I have the numbers right and not have to do um, the transfers multiple times. Um, the capital projects that we discussed at the last meeting, some of those are moving ahead already, and then you know where we're at with the budget. So, happy to take questions about the kind of expense report. Any questions for Shelly? Thank you. I'm looking for somebody in red or something <laughs> I'm leaving. You're not leaving yet. Skip's going to vote for you. <laughs> okay, uh, any public comment? Yes. <coughs> Bob, go ahead. Mr. Chairman, in reading the uh, newspaper in the last month and a half, two months, noticed uh, two prior faculty members, uh, Mr. John Siano, uh, who was a social studies teacher when I came to this great school seventh grader and he coached uh, involved in football basketball as well as the baseball teams for a number of years and uh, he retired and he passed away uh, a month or so ago and Howard Barnard uh, who taught social studies also in the school here he passed away and he is also a former chairman of the Greenfield School but he taught here a number of years I didn't happen to have him I did. I did. And he was a, he, what I understand, he was a great School teacher and everybody liked him. So I just wanted, if the chairman could draft a nice letter and send it to the respective families, and it would be a good taste. Okay. Super. I, there's somebody else, and I can't think of it, but. Next meeting. Next meeting. If next I next meeting. Can you give me the second name? I got Howard Bond. The, the first one? So it's John, John, John Siano. S I A N O. Okay, uh, student council report, daughter. <laughs> Did she leave you with anything? <laughs> she didn't, she left That's the all right. tonight. I hey. don't know what's going on. Absolutely. That's all right. <laughs> um, are we gonna do further discussion on proposed FY21 budget before we vote? Right? 
we need to talk about it as a group of you for it, or are we going to vote on it? We have enough to talk. Ain't so you, talk. you took public comment. Now you have to approve the budget. So it can be as simple as someone puts it forward right now. Most of the budget. Okay, slow your roll. She didn't put it on the tape. The tape so. yes. Yeah, I know what she wrote in the in that agenda, but when she gives me the next couple, so she doesn't get out what the rules are, and I didn't even hear them. That's for sure. So I let her run it. Firm, 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 firm,
but re remember that we would be paying the bill after July 1, so it goes on to the next fiscal year's assessment. So it has nothing to do with this year's budget. I keep up yeah. to say that a lot, but you get, get kind of, it's not one budget ahead, it's two budget ahead, because it's after July 1. That kind of so in essence, if it doesn't happen next fall, and we kind of line it up for after July 1, it wouldn't actually hit the 22, it hit the 23 budget. It, it, it kicks that that assessment, you know. The, but however, there would probably be other stuff happening on those other projects between. The committee's not holding just to do the track. It's not holding yeah, to do the track first. It was just trying to move that up. This would have been the worst one. Mm -hmm. For it to be there. Yeah. Bob was in the room. We yeah. invited Bob to be a part of the interview um, as a consultant to us for the interview. So he heard the complications there. I have to listen to it first. Sorry, we have a. Yeah. <laughs> we appreciate Lee, she's that. Still, Lee, she's still <laughs> talked to him. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I think a long time. <laughs> um, next, we're going to uh, vote on some policies. Do, do we just want to vote at, vote all of them at once and just list them? No, that what, that last one, that that last one <coughs> about the speaker's limits. You would have been having to argue with each one of them yep, constantly. So, so basically, remember, for confusion, All right. just to make sure you guys are adequately confused, <laughs> yeah. we were given a list of policies last month for the first reading. Those policies are, are being voted today and are listed in your agenda. Uh, the next set of policies were sent out as part of this pack. We didn't yeah. resend two sets of policies because so the, then you'd have Gotcha. 12 policies in front of you would be very confusing. So yes. we'll be voting on... I did just These confuse you all. Right. Okay, so we are, we will be discuss, we will be voting the first set of policy, which is the education equality, the equal education opportunities, the homeless students enrollment rights and services, the education opportunities for military children, the education opportunities for children in foster care, and the condom availability policy um, in procedure. So you're not voting in procedure. <laughs> just letting you know that that's, that shouldn't be in there. So, just on the um, you're just doing those policies, and then we are going to discuss the removal, the, the listing of the policies of the other ones. I won't list those out yet. Right? I will go through those and give you an overview for your reading, your first reading. Of those. So, I just listed all those policies. If you want to vote them as a group, you're certainly welcome, or you yeah. can ask to put a hold on one of them. Yeah. Thanks, Phil. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Phil. Sorry. Sorry for the detour. Good idea. <laughs> Do I have a first, a second? Second. Phil <laughs> was the first. I wrote down Phil was the first. Okay. Davey's the second. Does anybody else have any questions about the policies, not the procedures? All in favor? Thank you. And now we got a. Are we going to vote on this procedure? No. Okay. We're all done. Yeah, the, the procedure was included as informational about the. The application of the <laughs> <laughs> I can get Philip a okay. cheap laugh. All right, so uh, some new business. Some new business. Stacy, you're up. <laughs> well, hopefully by 2021 we'll be able to fly places, right? I know the coronavirus won't be a problem. Give me a second. Show off. <laughs> don't know me, I am Stacy Chapley. I'm one of the science teachers here at Frontier Regional. And we are big into technology. <laughs> 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 I was trying to see it down here, but I know I'm getting older because I can't see it down here. Hey, here, I got some glasses. It's in the age. Yeah. <laughs> 
Oh, thank you. It's on the H. All right. I don't have anything this fancy in my classroom. All right, present. Okay. All right, all right. So, um, and being the crazy, nerdy person that I am, um, I came across this wonderful um, opportunity to actually um, bring frontier students to Peru, to the headwaters of the Amazon, to do actual field science work, where they'll be working alongside um, specialists in their specific fields, herpetologists, ornithologists, you name it, <laughs> and grad students. Um, what I really love about this particular program is it's a not-for-profit, it's a non-profit organization that um, uses the money that the students pay to be able to go out and learn these um, key instrumental um, <laughs> techniques um, to further fund research. And this all comes out of Oxford University in England. Um, so, let's see. So, um, as I said, it's a conservation research organization that is funded by and relies on teams of student volunteers who join exp expeditions for the opportunity to work on real world research science programs alongside academic researchers. Um, they have research fields all over the world and I, this was one of my top choices. My other one was going to the Galapagos Islands, but looking at cost and funding, I felt it might be a little out of reach for us. Um, it's a two week program. We fly into Peru um, and for two weeks we stay on renovated rubber boats that used to transport rubber when that was the key source of rubber back around the 1900s, the late 1800s, early 1900s, and made them into um, floating science labs as well as um, dorms where um, we'll be fed three times a day and continue on that way. So um, they've done long-term research um, looking at the Amazon as far as uh, the availability of the resources to support the native people that live there, um, the impact of climate change, um, and the Mena Hydrovia dredging project where they're trying to go through the Amazon River Basin to connect the Atlantic Ocean to the Pacific Ocean and what kind of ecological disturbances that could create. Um, and so all this information is gathered to help with management of um, preserves that, I don't have the numbers, but over 10,000 acres, if not more like 10,000 square miles, but it's, it's the Amazon, it's big, everything's big down there. Okay. So opportunities for our students are as I said, they'll work side by side with researchers, graduate students, and they're going to be learning how to do scientific field studies. Um, they'll gain skills that can help them with their future career opportunities. Um, they can also have the opportunity to earn three college credits through the California University System for only $50, which as we all know, the cost of a credit at UMass is about $150 per credit. Um, and having this experience is going to help them um, <coughs> on their college applications, on um, future job applications. And they'll, um, as far as personal growth, they're going to be seeing what goes on outside our little world here in the wonderful Western Mass um, that we have. Um, they'll visit with the indigenous Kokama villages that benefit from this ongoing research and experience firsthand the impact that humans are having on ecosystems that are not in our backyard, that are far reaching. Um, as we look at developing countries and what developing countries and our carbon footprint is doing to other parts of the world. So, Lots of birds. 
Go back. So the students have a full suite of surveys uh, ranging from wading birds, looking at the cores, reptiles, so caimans, there's a great survey that they run here going out at night looking for reflection in the caiman's eyes and going out with the guides to pick up the caiman. So I got more or less a bus seat in the evening uh, on a boat. We go straight into the fish on the river and we try and then eventually catch a measure of all the problems that we see. So my role is to uh, lead surveys, mostly in mist netting, uh, to test for bird abundance and diversity. We've, we've seen a lot of different species of wood creepers, woodpeckers, ant birds, ant wrens, kingfishers, we've seen macaws, parrots, parakeets, egrets, cormorants, hawks, you name it. There are over 260 bird species within the Caius alone. About 1,800 different species in Peru. It's a once in a lifetime opportunity to come away with Operation Montea and to carry out my dissertation in the middle of the Amazon rainforest and spend six weeks in an environment which is completely foreign and completely different to anything I've ever experienced, which is brilliant. Um, all of the data that I actually collect gets compiled and, and it goes on to help preserve the wildlife. So not only am I conducting my dissertation and my research, I'm actually helping to contribute to a, a wider cause, which is, again, once in a lifetime, it's amazing. Amazon is the greatest recruiter in the world. It's the thing that you grow up watching documentaries on, like David Attenborough. Right, you see such a richness of species, and you see local people living in an intact ecosystem. It's, yeah, it's just beautiful. What life is absolutely very fun because basically you are in a hotel that is falling on the Amazon River, which is quite nice, absolutely. Work life is brilliant. I wake up every morning and look out the window, and there are people with dolphins just, just swimming by, grey dolphins, turtles, all sorts of brilliant. It's great fun, and of course it's like living in a community because you get to know each other very, very well. You will be sharing rooms with with people that you didn't meet before, so yeah, you you kind of bond quite well. So it's really an amazing place to stay. Not many people get the opportunity. It's a it's a really unique experience for the students, uh, being able to to move their way into the heart of the Caius and Mary as well. We have a system here, which is an indigenous based system and it's working. People now see giant group every day. Dolphin numbers are higher than they've ever been. Wading numbers are higher than they've ever been. Uh, we're starting to see cranes we've never seen them before. To me the Amazon rainforest means it's an incredible and a bit of a dream come true to be here. It'll make you go home and want to Look for the beauty in, in the ecosystems around you and want to conserve those and, and interact with those. Can you not be going swimming, by the way? <laughs>
So he was talking about how the river dolphin population is up and some of the other aquatic species of animals are up. Um, this particular part of um, the, uh, the basin to the Amazon is a floodplain. And so if we're going in the summertime when it's the dry season and the water has recessed, land mass during the flood season increases so there's only about 10% available for the animals, organisms living on, on the earthen part. And they've seen a decrease in those populations. Um, you see the, the, the macaws here and we, they'll learn that they're an indicator species. So when we see a high population of the macaws, we know that um, the, the trees and the fruits and the nuts are, are, are producing enough availability. If we see a decrease in the macaw population, what's the underlying factors? What's going on? Um, and so there's a whole, there's a lot for me to learn too which I, I would love to look into. So they're going to be um, studying, and they'll be, they'll be having lectures along the boat. It's a two-day boat ride to where um, we'll be docking. Um, so they're looking at biodiversity, um, Amazon biogeography, um, ecological survey methods, the Amazonian fish populations, amphibians, reptiles, bird diversity, um, that importance, the rainforest mammals, and conservation synthesis. And so um, there's something like 20 different types of primates that are down in this area. Um, they set up night cams to catch um, the, the nocturnal animals. And they can actually identify these guys by their spots. They're very specific. Um, so, so I would love to have the approval of the school board to, to move forward. I have five students that I've already shown interest to and are ready to go. It's the summer of um, end of June, beginning of July 2021. Oh. So it's a, a year from the summer. You said it was a two week program? It's a two week program. How much approximately? It's approximately around 3,300. Wow, that's not bad. So um, it's not, as I said, it's a not for profit. So that takes a huge chunk out. Um, there's a million dollar policy. Um, that's included in that um, for any type of emergencies. There's trained medical staff. Um, if a need arises and somebody has to be transported to a hospital, they medevac them out. Um, but in the 15 plus years they've been running this particular program, they haven't had any um, need for that. So um, students are accompanied by um, adults, there's the first aid training, you name it, so. Do you do anything else culturally in the country? Like, that, I mean, that's like a culture, but like, do you do like Lima? Do you do anything? Do you, I mean, you, uh, you've got to fly in and out of some place. Right, right. Do you, right, right. Do, you so do like a museum or two or like? <laughs> so I wrote it, we fly into a little city called Iquitos, and oh, the only wow. way to get there is flying in and out, uh, which was the capital big big time city when the rubber trade was was in its prime so um, so we don't do any you know we That's basically it. we fly into cool. Aikido um, we go to a, a secondary location um, all of which is on the Amazon and then we board the boats so flying on seaplanes or just regular airfield? regular airfield yeah I assume all the kids would have to get um, any extra immunizations or anything. Yeah, the biggest the biggest thing um, is malaria. Yep. So, but yeah. Anybody else have any more questions? I think it's the coolest proposal that I've seen nice. like, like yeah. ever. <laughs> so, good cool. job, Stacy. Is, is there a specific number of kids that you need to go? Um, I have five right now. I'm going with those five. Um, I can have up to 16, so there is a limit. So do you know anybody who's interested? <laughs> I mentioned it to Abby last year. Right, but she, she'll probably graduate. She'll be a senior. Be a great senior. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but yeah, so as I said, you know, it's, it's um, 
to me it's exciting. Yeah. And it's a once in a lifetime. Thanks, Stacy. Nice job. So we have a motion, we have a second. Do we also have any more questions? Yes, we do. Great. Does everybody else have any questions? All in favor? Stacy, you can't go. <laughs> You're welcome. I might have to borrow those twins when they come back. Okay. First reading on some various policy changes. Mr. Darius? Sure. These are all, except the last one, are, are, are pretty boring. So basically, the uh, it's a vote to remove the basic. These are all re recommended by, you actually got this as, a, as a, an attachment, this newsletter, an email. So these were all um, policies that were um, removed, either they're redundant or now unnecessary due to other laws or um, policies that we've already done. So, you know, removing the basic instructional program, the language there, um, the student insurance program, which is no longer done in that capacity, the guidance program, we're not removing the guidance program, we're removing this policy, <laughs> um, student gifts and solicitations, um, there's already laws and such. The biggest one that I, is, it would probably be the most discussion is the public comment at school committee meetings. Mm -hmm. Um, as you can see, if you have a color version like me, it, it's red. Um, <laughs> you guys didn't get one. Um, but basically, there's a lot of changing there um, to put in some restraints. Um, not restraints, but um, we have a lot of people speaking. Some parameters. Um, I'm trying to look up what they. Yeah, that's kind of unfriendly. I mean, it, like th that's like a big so. This is this is every once in a while the mask one size fits all kind of, like concept kind of falls apart, and this is one of them. Like if you're in the big city or if you have sort of the professional school committee antagonists that some communities do have, um, yeah, the, the, then something like this where you are restricting every speaker to three minutes and you are respecting uh, restricting all public speech to 15 minutes, something like that can make sense, but. Um, we are all small towns, and it, um, you, the, you, you can regulate speech to some extent. Like I'm, a, it's, it should be grounds for removal from the meeting if they cuss, and as commonly defined by George Carlin's seven words. Yeah. Um, and you know, if if they say that, that you, it, it's it's a, and um, you, there should be prohibitions against repeating yourself and annoying the school committee members, but. Uh, <laughs> Other than that, um, it, I'm not I'm not really in favor of regulating the time the time of people's speech, especially if they're coherent and making sense and whatever. And then once you once you exceed the limit for one person, and others are in the room, those are all cans of worms, and they make they make. Can't the chairman decide on? That's the current way. That's the way I would I would like to keep it. If you're that coherent, you know. So, I mean, it, it makes sense if there's really, this is sort of like a defensive thing to do with. It's like something that happened like in Sunderland a, a little while back when we had, how many speakers did you have for how long? Oh, yeah. Over, over there, first hour okay. meeting with speakers. So where this would help? So the, the issue is not the first the first meeting where the first hour of speakers, this, the issue is the second meeting with the same hour of speakers to again, Give yeah, them, and to address so, information that the committee already knows, and 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 the committee can adopt limits at any time, and you can adopt mid, whatever. But three minutes, three three minutes, it, and you can read a lot in three minutes. It, well, but the chairman can run the meeting and run it with discretion, wide time off. I, I think it puts on the spot while it is their discretion it's really hard to interrupt someone for example a teacher who is pouring their heart out about why they should get an equitable and fair contract and you know it's it doesn't put that person in a good position or I think the school committee in a good position to cut them off in that way this would allow stricter guidelines around it which maybe three minutes isn't enough but you know, 
for everybody to have an unlimited amount of time. It's difficult. It's not, a, it's not saying that they only have three minutes. It's saying that written, comment, written comments longer than three minutes may be presented to the chair. Number two. Yes. Number two, the speakers will be allowed three minutes to present their material. Oh, yeah. This is what happened I started at the bottom. <laughs> Sorry. In, I and so the presiding chair may <laughs> permit an extension this time later. You know, you know, when we have guests of, like, we, well, tonight was an open, that was a, it's a, that was an open uh, forum for that, public but hearing. it's a public hearing, rather, so you're actually, there would know, be a difference in that. Right. But if someone was to come to talk about something, you know, we don't have a lot of public comment, but this does put protections in place when public comment takes over, yeah, I, I, takes I over actually, the business of the meeting. I, I, I get can. that, but I actually think that, that in, the, in the long run, it's better for everybody generally for, for people just to have their say and that and um, you know that uh, I if people are, are care enough about it to come and put their time into it then I care enough about it to listen to what they have to say or at least to pretend I'm listening um, <laughs> so, but, I mean, I, so I'll, I'll give you some <laughs> answer a and I'll give you some life experience that I have in the sense that I was on the Amherst School Committee and public comment is a big part of their meeting, and if they didn't have parameters in place, their meetings would be over three hours in length, and people would be able to pontificate on the different subjects that are important to them. And if you don't have policy to back yourself back up, the, the chair can't make will make a decision, and then be considered. See, I, I would get be, it. For, I know, get it for Amherst. I just I mean, I've been on school this nine years now, and I've never been in a meeting um, where where restricting people's length of time makes any made any sense to me at all um, yeah, I have well, the years I've been here also meeting where somebody took their shoe off and pounded the table under the table with the shoe but, on a <laughs> 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 style points for stuff like that but, but, but understand that our current our current policy is a three minute that's not new language Speakers will have three minutes to present their material as the current policy, the addition, and must begin their comments by stating their name and the city and town. And the presiding chair may permit an extension of this time, and in, in red is in extenuating, in extenuating circumstances. So basically, that's currently, that's what our policy is now. So um, within if, that timeline. Um, if you've sat through a reduction in force here, or the death and burial of the Redskin, if you've sat through that stuff, you'll understand how important something like this is. If you haven't sat through one of those debacles, then you don't understand how this works. Those are the two that come to mind. I've been here 45 years. Those are the first two that come to mind. Is reduction in force that we did with staff 25 years ago and, and the, the Redskin, the mascot issue. See, that's a, those should be tough decisions. It, those should be, you should hear from people. I'm not so saying we, you don't we, hear from people. As long as, as long as. I don't want to hear from a person Phil, ad nauseum. Okay. Phil, as long as it's not thing. the same people getting up, reading the same thing over and over again, something that's printed out. So if you get three people, or four people, five people reading the same letter that we just heard from the first person, I think that's where somebody needs to be cut off. If you can't, yeah. if you don't have the tools in place, you can't use them. Yeah. You can also, you can selectively sort of ignore the tools. If you I like, I like to talk about tools, it ahead of time. You can't use them. Yes. You know, you're here for a particular reason. How many people are going to speak? You get an idea how many people are going to speak, so that way you can plan on what's going to happen that night. You may go overboard, you can break the policy. I can take my shoe off and I can go. Yeah. No, you're from Whaley. The guy was from Conway. He was from Conway. He was from Conway. <laughs> So basically on this, so this is the recommendation by MASC. You also, so we just kind of throw your options out to this. One, you can just let Phil be the vote against it, okay? But you can move forward with this, you can move forward with this, moving, you can move forward with this and, and you can go with the majority vote that you feel this is the policy you want to do. You can send it to your policy subcommittee to discuss changing it to do that. Um, but this, my job is to bring you forward the recommendations from MASC. They're saying they're suggesting these changes, and if you read through where the red parts are, there are some areas where, um, you know, where it tightens up a little bit. That is, uh, that can be, be helpful in times where there's stress in the chair. And there's also there's you know language about in there if you read through about public comment goes through the chair. 
They don't come in and start yelling at individual people on the committee or speaking, you know, you know, at me. It's a, it's a, it's a it goes to the chair. You speak to the chair to discuss a problem. You know, because sometimes people come with emotions behind their thing. It's just about creating civility in that. So. Um, Oh, but this is just a just a just a, just a, just a, just a reading. We're going to discuss it next time again too. So, no, no, no. Next time, next time I won't say a word. No, you only get three minutes. Next yeah, time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's a couple questions. So the the, the crossed out language and the black language is the language that we already have is already our policy. Yes. The black. Um, what's written in black is the old policy. What's written in red is the new policy, and what's crossed out was the old policy that was removed. Okay. Oh. So and then, so the last one, number six, about the sign up. So. An instance like tonight, if we don't have a sign-up sheet every single time and have people sign up, but we in violation of our own policy, or should there be language in there that gives the chair discretion about whether we need to go through this exact policy or not? In, in, in total, there is language in there about the chair having discretion for individual speakers, but we're going to have to, you know, I find it very rare that we've ever had to really do this. Right. So unless we're falling into a T, are we going to put ourselves in that? It says sign-up instructions. I guess I written. guess if we have something in the morning, right now, the chair has to say, are there, is there any public comment? You, you give the instructions on how they comment. That's I mean, I don't see it. Oh, but so I'm hearing like verbal, I'm reading, but, but, but should we have? Uh, I agree with Keith saying. Sign in, like, what's my line? The chair, based on the number of comments or the top, you know, the top, you know, the chair can weave. If we have one policy, person, we're going to make them sign in and do all right. that. You know. We have it, but the recording secretary is going to need to get their name. But this is the same policy as going to all the elementaries, and, and, the, and it's question. the same. It's the same issue there. The elementary, you have one person comments. It. Yeah, I just wanted to comment that you know, yeah. it, it, you're right. You have to do a sign-in sheet and that kind of thing. Um, I will do for my homework. I will get. I will talk with the attorney about whether or not we can put a line in there that they can be waived based on the chair's judgment of the public comment, of the capacity for public comment that in your, some kind of language there. Should I do that? Informal. We can do the last much more informal. All right, I'm going to make two minutes. Are we so all done with? I will send that language out to you prior to the meeting so you can have it as you're, as you're reading. OK, reports. Just want to let you know that my knee replacement went well. <laughs> I've, been, I've, been, I've been itching over here to get out of here, so I, I won't talk too long. But it was very successful. Can't sleep at night, but it feels good to have a new knee. Be play after only two and a half weeks. I'm driving. Driving to Springfield today for PT. So, so. Uh, collaborative. Nothing. Meeting until Okay. Uh, George, I think you handed out something. Yeah, I, uh, I well, actually I didn't hand out something. I sent, I shared it to people electron with people electronically. If anybody needs a hard copy, let me know. Uh, just a couple brief things. Just a reminder: we are going to be presenting the musical Annie. It's coming up uh, Friday, March 13th at seven. <laughs> Saturday, March 14th, also at seven, and Sunday, March 15th at two. Whose dog? So be there. Whose dog do you use? Okay. What's that? Whose dog do you use? I have, I don't know. Whose dog are we using? Uh, we're using Connus. It is um, one of our um, school choice in people's dogs. So is it a three o'clock? It's at three o'clock. It's a three, all right. Oh, My apologies. It's a three o'clock on, <laughs> on the 15th, so be there. Um, I wanted to let people, just a reminder, uh, early release days are back uh, in March. We're continuing to work uh, on PD. We're going to be continuing our focus on special ed. Uh, I shared a couple of links as well, some of the new instructional software uh, that we're going to be, intro that we're gonna be uh, introducing uh, more fully, uh, including Paradax, uh, including New ZLA, which, which um, allows us to differentiate instruction, which is wonderful. Um, I also wanted to, once again, highlight the fact that we're continuing to work with our peer mentors. We currently have uh, 19 high school students who are working uh, on a consistent basis with our middle school, with our eighth grade students. Um, we've been working with, we have worked with fallacies. Uh, we've got the One Love Foundation coming in uh, shortly to also to continue their training. Uh, and uh, we've started having sort of preliminary discussions with um, some of the elementary school principals about potentially having the peer mentors after they're trained go down 
uh, perhaps not for this year, but maybe for next year to go down and visit uh, with the sixth graders uh, and try to try to w and work with them as well. Uh, and last but not least, very important, uh, we want to congratulate Steve Blinder, who is our math uh, department chair and one of our math teachers. He's uh, won the Grinspoon Award for Excellence in Teaching. Steve is an amazing teacher. If you ever have the opportunity to pop into this class, you will be. Um, You'll, you'll, you'll love it. Um, he's a great guy, a great teacher. Uh, we're lucky to have him. So we want to congratulate Steve as well. Um, uh, Can I ask the other, all of you a dumb question? Do you all get George's report? No. I could though. It, it does not get to me. I shared, so I shared it this afternoon. Could so, get it. 12.25. Oh, okay. Because I have all my, the Gmail account forwarded to a Comcast. Yeah. And I get, I get Donna stuff and I get, but, I don't, yeah, so come, I don't know where it, where it goes, but yeah, it doesn't get to I can, I can, I can make you a copy if you want one, but I can, I can, is it better to send you it as an attachment? So today what I did was I shared it as a Google Doc. Right. Yep. I'd rather get it as an attachment. Okay. But I'm a short timer. Yeah. Well, that's true. So I can do that. I'll get it to you. Next week, you've forgotten, then you're done. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I use my strategy out loud. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 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 I'll send it to you, though. And Bob will send it to you as well. I put on the different committee for years. Gary, it's your turn. So um, I just kind of wanted to get people to speed up. I sent out the, uh, the the coronavirus or COV ID 19. Um, I sent out the the, the, the uh, letter I sent to the community. Um, I now have a, basically on our website links um, for people to look on to to see how we're making decisions and such. It's a wait and see from the school's perspective. There's no magic. No eight ball that we look at to, to figure out what we're supposed to do next. We're going to have to take advice from um, local and state health. Um, the one thing that is going to be coming across is that we do have three foreign trips coming up. Um, we probably have the most in the area for foreign trips right now. Um, the Netherlands trip, which is only in a few weeks, um, we're going to have to make that decision within the next week or so. Um, right now, um, just looking at it, um, they, they do have insurance for the trip, so that's not really the concern. But can we postpone? And we're, we're in conversation with the the Netherlands about, you know, can we move it to another time? Um, that kind of thing. So there is a confirmed case in Oregon, which is where the trip goes. Yeah. yeah. In Oregon, and that's the Netherlands. That's where the trip goes. There is a confirmed case. That's a case in Boston. So it's, it is one of those things where it's the balancing of... If a child gets sick, are they going to fly him home? So who's going to pay that cost? There's insurance. Don't we have insurance on all that? We don't have insurance on it. We can take out you know, travel insurance. And that particular one, that would be the family's responsibility to fly him home. Yeah, my question is. Yeah, I think if, if I was traveling, I'd be more concerned about somebody telling me that I have to stay here for 14 days because the guy three doors down has the virus. So I'm not going anywhere for 14 days. I'm just thinking about financial. <laughs> the kid's there and they're sick, and they're going to have to pay the money to bring them home. That that's a scary thing. So. Um, Basically, <laughs> let me put this back out there. Um, you approve these trips. You have the rights to unapprove them. However, right now, it's um, I've talked with other superintendents, and superintendents are making a decision based on um, executively based on information they're getting from basically where the trip is going, you know, how it's being, those kind of things. So, um, actually, I just got a thing from. And I tell you, the, the, the amount of emails that we have going around on this, the state right now. Um, I probably have a list of 30 trips across Massachusetts, and we probably have, I'm looking through about 60% have canceled to various places throughout either Europe, Eastern Europe, even China's on the list. Um, and um, others are undecided. Only one was where the school committee put a moratorium on all international travel, and that was Westville. So the rest are being done Does by the school nurse have an opinion on this stuff? If we only can find one. 
Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I had to come and I told you. you just um, so I am working with, with um, you know, we can ask, you know, Ashley can, can, can chime in, um, but I have been working with um, Mad Gardner's leader as well on multiple things. What are we doing here? What are we doing about talking to people? There's a funny line between being careful and like my friend that dropped off a case of Corona beer at my house because, you know, coronavirus. Yeah. And, and I hope you didn't touch that. Did no, it tastes there? like water. It's awful. But, Did he um, sit there and drink it with you? No, I gave it to somebody else because coronavirus. Wow, just a little bottle. <laughs> There's really it's only like one case of Corona out there. It just goes. Were you guys asking Ashley a question? Or you... Nope. All right. Cancel or keep it? I think it's a wait and see at this time. I think that the hype around the concern is, it, it's really a dog and pony show in, that me, in the media right now. I think it's a valid concern to watch. Um, I, I, I can't get super excited about one confirmed case in the community where they're going unless they're not handling that well. But in a country like, you know, in a region like the Netherlands where there's healthcare that is accessible to all, I feel confident that it would be handled well. And if all the, the communications are taking place appropriately and people are being vigilant, um, and monitoring the situation, I don't feel a choice, a decision at this time me needs to be made. I think if um, travel advisories are put in place, that's very significant. That would kind of, I think, concretely guide our um, approach. And, uh, you know, it really just depends. Um, Mr. Decker, you said if a student were to get sick, um, and needed to fly home, where would that cost come from? I don't think a student who became ill would be flown home. I think they would remain there and be quarantined and the parent may or may not need to fly over, which I know for some of our international trips is written into the agreement that if you're sending your kid and they have an accident, injury, or illness that requires stay, you have to go there. The parent is respond. It is incumbent upon the parent to go. Um, who pays? The parents. If you're flying yourself, who are you paying? But that could be anything. Yeah. That could be anything. True, they break a leg. They break a leg, but I mean, honestly, a person with a broken leg can likely fly home. However, they get hit by a bus, and they're not gonna. Yeah. Not that that's gonna happen. I'm just saying. Okay, uh, common expression. Uh, common expression, but like if you're laid up extensively, that could be a reason why a parent needed to go join. Um, and I think we need to just evaluate the regions and what's going on there. Um, so if we vote the superintendent authorization to use his discretion on those scheduled trips, I mean his good conscience thinks they should be uh, deferred to defer on. Why are you guys making the decision? What <laughs> <laughs> this board is not going to be until sometime in April. Right. This is early March. Um, right. Was my, I, asked, um, I asked other superintendents in the past when they had to cancel trips, did it go back to the school committee? And they said no due to the timing of it. It was an administrative decision. So I'm just saying in practice that's what it was. I'm just saying I'm not trying to take power away from it. Currently, if you guys oh, want to make this decision, I'll turn the information. You guys can make the decision. But um, like I said, right now we're we're um, with the Netherlands trip, which is the one trip that we kind of control. We're not using um, an outside company to run the trip. The other trips that are happening in April, which can give us you know a little bit more time, those are run. If they aren't canceled by the company that's doing it, there's no refund. Okay, unless they bought the additional insurance. And so. And we're not even sure who has the insurance on those things. They're getting that information for us now because the money doesn't come through the school on those right. micro things. On the Dutch trip, that exchange, we, to reduce costs, we got rid of the travel agency we've been doing it ourselves for the last few years. So, but they do have travel insurance, full refund, I mean, the full insurance, you know, how some have like no pandemic, no acts of terrorism, that kind of, they have the full refund insurance. So, you know, we're, at this point, you have to understand when they go um, to the Netherlands, all other countries are sending kids at the same time. Remember that kind of whole thing? And so you, there's, a, there's other factors here than just, they're not just visiting a country, they're going there and 
and becoming part of the community, which is a lot different than being on a tour bus, going to a couple sites and back to your hotel. They're going in and living with families as long as well as many other nations coming together. So I, we have a feeling that it's going to be postponed or canceled of that, of that thing. But at the same time, we're trying to, even if they cancel on their end, we're trying to work with the Dutch to maybe do something, a visit outside of their programming for this particular group of students and then continue next year. And even maybe even to next year. So that's what we're proposing out there. Has any communication gone out to the families of the kids involved in those trips that it's at least under consideration? There's a draft. We met today to go through it. There's a draft on my desk. Yes. So that will be going out um, probably tomorrow morning. Um, so but at the same time, we're trying to figure out, trying to get information. Right now, we don't have information only that we're looking at it. Um, so, and then we have to, we have a deadline of that coming up too. So, you know, there's a parent meeting on the 11th. Decision has to be made by then, if not before then. Um, okay. The last thing I know everybody's tired wants to get out of here, um, but you just need to understand that I gave you a handout that's double sided, which is I also sent you a link on the website that does the whole student opportunity plans. So I just kind of went just, just to leave it on a good note. So, as part of the student opportunity act, because some schools are getting a lot of money, they um, the state wants accountability for how you're spending your Chapter 70 money. And so we got $17,000 at Frontier. Um, you know, proportionally, it sounds like a $17,000 sounds like a lot of money. It's, it's nothing, it's a drop in the bucket. Um, we had to fill out a form with the states called the short form for those receiving under $1.5 million, um, had to fill out the short form, which is the majority of the states, 80% of the state got less than $1.5 million. Um, but we just got the per, per yard per pupil. But we have to justify how we are spending it. And so we are just gonna um, continue to what, the, what we're already working on, which is inclusion, include, include teaching for students with disabilities and English language learners. It's a process we've already started by changing the schedule last year, allowed us to change the delivery of special education. Um, and so we're looking at doing more a co-teaching model um, with that. So our professional development's already lined up in that. It falls in as a, we turn it over. It falls in as a um, one of the one of the uh, exemplars that they're using for how to use the money. So it's it's kind of falling into there. But I I sent you the whole the link to the page if you're interested in all that. But it's just interesting that we get less and less Chapter 70 money, and now they want us to justify how we're using that money um, through a research base. You got it's got to fit under certain criteria. Do they actually collect them and care about, about what you say when you send it in? So like, like the even better, you guys will you'll, 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 you'll like this as a school. Around. You'll like this as a school committee. Um, they want school committee approval of it. Okay, so we'll vote it on the next. I didn't have time to put it on here for a vote. Um, approval of it, but they say go ahead and send it in, even if you don't have approval. So we make the April first deadline. So apparently your approval isn't that important. If I can send it in without it, <laughs> just to make it. It's in. If you watch the if you watch the side show, you can hear them say that. Just, you know, please just get it in for April 1st. What if you don't get it in? Well, we'll be calling. Curious, maybe they'll call me. I'd like to uh, talk about it. But, and just, just another pain in the butt is I have to do five of them. Because each district has to submit its own one. Even if you're in a regional situation or a union, rather, um, they want each school to send its own two-page report on these kind of things. So, And you're talking Conway got $2,000. So I can explain how that two thousand dollars is going to change how we're doing education. <laughs> no sarcasm, at the state. No sarcasm at all. All right. Um, and then I just have the list of what I have ongoing. So we'll officially vote it because I got to get that on the blocks at the next meeting. But um, that's what. Yeah. Anybody else have anything? Yeah. All in favor? Yeah. yeah. Thank you.